Well, today I want to speak to you about a topic that uh, was a life changer for me. I'm going to be talking about cardiovascular disease. It's not that I suffer from cardiovascular disease, but when I was a young boy, my father had a fairly successful agricultural business, and he hired a lot of people, and uh, the guys did the work, and I had... Uh, I had the, the luxury of you know going to school and coming home and playing with my dog and my race car set and whatever, and I have to admit I was a pretty lazy young, young boy. Um, <clears throat> I kind of see a lot of the lazy young boys in society today, a lot of teenagers, they're couch potatoes, whatever. I was way more active than that. I liked my horse and to trek around through the bush and whatever. I had a lot of fun doing a lot of things, but work was not one of them. And, I just hated to work. And uh, my mother would try and make me work. She was an old country lady and she would, uh, she'd crack the whip on me and she would make me work. But I was very, very um, anxious to escape from her at any time that I possibly could. And my father was a little more easygoing and we would, uh, I'd work with him sometimes and he'd try to make it fun and, and he'd tell me stories and you know just to entertain me, to keep me around. Still. You know, he was a beekeeper, and so getting stung by bees and getting honey in my hands and getting sticky was just wasn't that much fun, and I didn't enjoy it very much. And I, he said I was, uh, he was certain there was some Houdini genetics in our family tree because I could vanish off the job site faster than, than anything. But uh, he, I think there was some Sherlock Holmes in him because he always found me and put me back to work again. I. Um, I did that for a number of years, did everything I could to not work, and then one day my father was working in his warehouse and it was cold and he was shoveling snow outside and going back into his warehouse and running equipment and things and uh, sort of a tragedy, but he, uh, he came upstairs uh, in the house and he sat down in his chair and it was about two o'clock in the afternoon and he said, I just don't feel very well. And my mom asked him, well, what's wrong? Do you have a headache? No. You sick to your stomach? No. Well, what's wrong with you? I don't know. <clears throat> he said, I just don't know what's wrong with me. And uh, so we began to ask him questions and of course we were as non-medical as could possibly be and uh, we didn't have a clue and my mom said, well, you should go to the doctor. And he said, I'm not going to the doctor. I'm just going to sit here and I'll rest a while and I'll feel better. And well, he sat there for an, about an hour and she came back in, looked at him. And she said, do you feel any better? And he said, no, I think I feel worse. And she said, well, then I'm going to take you to the clinic. He said, I am not a baby. You're not taking me. I'll drive myself. So he got in the car and he drove himself off to the clinic where they ran some tests on him, determined that he had had a pretty severe heart attack. And... Uh, it was kind of a shock for us. He was only about 52 years of age. And, uh, you know, he was a big, burly-looking guy, very, very healthy-appearing, uh, other than he had a few extra pounds that he didn't need. And uh, we were totally surprised with it. And so he's at the clinic, and the doctor said, well, we'll get the ambulance and take you over to the hospital. And he said, no, 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 I'm, I'm not taking any ambulance to the, I could drive myself. I drove myself over here. So the doc says, well, you better be there in 15 minutes. And he says, well, give or take a few. So anyway, we live 10 miles from town. He went to the grocery store and picked up my mom's groceries for her and brought them home. And about the time he got there, the, the hospital was calling and they were frantic. And uh, the doctor was just, uh, he was really excited. And he said, where is he? Where is he? Did he die along the way? And my mom says, what? What? What's wrong with him? And he told her. And so we got all excited. And of course, we drove him to the hospital where he nearly died. Um, very, very close to losing my father from cardiovascular disease. He had a major, major heart attack. Um, you know, it was devastating to him, but it made a man out of me. I was 14 years old, and I discovered that if our family was going to continue on having groceries on the table and a roof over our head, somebody was going to have to go to work and take my father's place, and that somebody was me. And so it, uh, it was a good thing in that respect, but uh, it was a bad thing in my father's, my father's life. Uh, he never was able to be a really healthy, viable person in the workforce again. He was frustrated, you know, till the day he died because he really wanted to get out and do things that he could not do. And he felt like he was a prisoner inside of a broken body that, that just he couldn't ever be who he was again. And uh, it, was a, it was a really discouraging uh, rest of life for him. 
He, he uh, eventually, though, uh, my mother was very concerned about him because he kept having smaller reoccurring heart attacks. And uh, she took him to the uh, Pritikin Longevity Center in Colorado. And there they learned to eat differently, um, different lifestyle. They, he learned how to exercise. He learned how to de-stress. And a lot of good things came out of that. And uh, I learned a lot from that, is uh, just being able to, to be a bystander in his life and, and watch how his life transpired. Some things that I noticed uh, originally, uh, the lifestyle was different. Yes, he got cardiovascular exercise. The, the dietary changes were drastic. Uh, we were from the Midwest and Wisconsin, meat and potatoes sort of a country. Um, our diet was quite heavy. It was fat. It was low fiber. Um, and uh, there was a fair amount of uh, carbo a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of sugars, but there wasn't way too much fat in our diet. And so my mother goes off and learns how to cook differently. And, and it was it was different. Um, yes, it was good for them, and it probably would have been good for me, but it was so drastically different to a spoiled teenager that I rebelled against it. <clears throat> and I would sneak any kind of food that I could get that wasn't the stuff that my mom made as possible. But thankfully, eating healthy has come a long ways. It's grown a long, long ways, and there are many good, good cooks uh, who are cooking healthy foods today. <clears throat> but you know... Cardiovascular disease didn't just happen in my family. It's a major, major contributor to death. If you look at statistics, uh, I'm going to look at uh, uh, our chart here called Death in America, the number of deaths for leading causes of death. Um, heart disease in a year in the United States, 631,636 people uh, die from heart disease, cardiovascular disease in the United States. And I realize we're, we're doing this presentation in Canada, and I'm going to keep referring to uh, America as the United States is American. I understand you're part of North America. And I, when as I was in South America, I, the people said, hey, we're Americans too. Um, but I don't know. Somebody, somebody called uh, us people from the United States Americans, and it kind of stuck, and it's a hard habit to, to break. Cardiovascular heart disease actually is a much larger killer even than cancer. Many people are succumbing to cancer, and sometimes for the same reasons as we'll discover in some of our, some of our uh, talks along the way here. Um, over a half a million people dying a year in the United States from cancer. Uh, stroke, which is a related uh, disease, 137,119 people. Um, you know, then you've got the rest of these, you know, chronic lower respiratory diseases. Uh, you know, people are dying from pneumonias. And, and that, the reason for pneumonias can be viral, can be bacterial. And we find a lot of people who have lowered and compromised immune systems are fighting with uh, chronic lower respiratory diseases. Many people are HIV positive. It's one of the things that they die from because their immune system simply cannot maintain uh, the uh, integrity that it needs. And uh, this is you know, one of the things that they're continually treated for. Accidents, uh, you know, we're talking unintentional injuries, things like car accidents, falling off of ladders and construction sites, uh, electrocution, gunshot wounds, whatever. We're, we're looking at about 121,000 a year. Diabetes, which uh, depending on who you talk to, may or may not be related again, 72,000. Uh, 449 Alzheimer's disease, 72,432, almost identical numbers with Alzheimer's as with diabetes. Influenza and pneumonia, 56,000. Kidney diseases and uh, infections, septicemia, 34,000. We're looking at a lot of people dying, but the most profound number that we have is cardiovascular disease or heart disease. You know, having this in my family really, really, uh, it, it was devastating financially to us. Very difficult uh, 
to look at your budget and say, okay, where is the, where's the income going to come now that it's all going out to medical care? We did not have any, any health insurance uh, to, to speak of. What we had was uh, pretty limited. Uh, you know, the, uh, our contribution was pretty amazing, uh, large, and we, you know, we paid on it for a long time. And then the loss of income that went along with it, of course, that was very... Uh, very profound. My parents tried to keep me in school somewhat. You know, at 14, you're supposed to be a high school student. You're supposed to be learning. <clears throat> I spent most of my high school time learning um, on the job. I learned a lot of management skills because I was the boss over guys who are, you know, 30, 40, 50 years of age, and this 14-year-old kid has to run the, run the operation, tell them what to do. And I learned a lot about people and managing people from that. I learned a lot about mathematics just from being on the job and doing business, getting my change at truck stops and, and, and things of that nature. I, I learned it on a practical nature. And uh, I found it a little bit challenging to go back to school when it was college years, and uh, uh, I was old and old enough. My parents had retired by that time, and I was able to actually go to school. It was a challenge. Uh, and anybody who has had a, a person with cardiovascular disease in their family knows the challenges that it majorly upsets your routine in, in a big way. And uh, we look at in the United States, heart disease costs more than $300 billion a year to our country. Um, that would include the cost of the health care itself, you know, for the doctor visits, for the surgeries, uh, for the pacemakers, uh, for the medications, and then for lost productivity uh, to the wage earners. $300 billion a year due to cardiovascular disease. You know, my brother and I were talking, you know, we're, we're in the age when we looked back and, and all of the, the male members of our family, uh, look at, you know, grandparents, um, look at my grandfather, my uncles, my father, and, you know, people are saying, well, you know, heart, heart, you know, heart disease runs in your family. And I, you know, I was a little bit scared of that. I was really afraid and, and worried about it. And, and then my brother said something profound. He's a few years older than I am, and I guess he's a little bit wiser. I always look to him for wisdom. And he said one day, he said, you know, don't get too worked up over this. He said, it, it just occurred to me that speaking English runs in our family as well. He said, what do you think that perhaps heart disease may be something that's trained into us. And I'm, I'm like questioning him, well, what do you really mean by that? He said, well, if it's lifestyle related, our family uh, has not necessarily inherited genetically, we've inherited it as a, uh, something that's been passed down from generation to generation. You know, we ate what our parents taught us, they ate what their parents taught, and they ate what their parents taught. And perhaps that's the way it is. He said, look at our own lifestyles. We're, we're sort of type A people, we move very rapidly, we're always involved in things, we work too hard, we take on too many things, we, we're uh, unfortunately always getting ourselves into something that's stressful because we're a little bit on the overachiever side and um, you know we don't get the cardiovascular exercise we're not into aerobics we're not jogging I mean we just work 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 what do you suppose that that could be a potential and I begin to think about it he probably doesn't even remember this conversation it's been a long time ago but it made me think and I began to really research and study and I really think he was on to something with that as I have be continued on studying um, heart disease is a major contributor, not just to men, but also to women. Um, when heart disease began to be a major factor in the United States population, it, originally it seemed like it was more men than women. Today we see as almost as many women as we see um, men. And I think the reason is, you know, we're primarily eating from the same table and uh, we have to have two wage earners in every family, and with the divorce rates we have, we have so many single, single parents, single women, who are in the workforce, and uh, you know the women are not doing blue-collar menial jobs anymore. They're not just janitors or uh, waitresses anymore. So many women today have white-collar jobs. They are in, you know, in administration. They have a lot of pressure. Uh, you know, the, they're kind of like in a in a, a steamer and a steam a pressure cooker with the jobs that they have, and you know they're working extra hours and. Uh, 
you know, by the time the year 2006 had rolled around, women were having as much issues with heart attacks and heart disease as, as men were. In, uh, in the year 2006, there's the latest statistics that I found that uh, um, I want to share with you today. A total of 631,000 people, uh, 636 people in the U.S. died of heart attack. Um, of that deaths, uh, 26 uh, percent or more than one in every four were caused by heart attack, uh, you know, by heart, heart disease. Just we're, we're looking at uh, huge numbers uh, out of a population that are really pretty profoundly scary. Um, heart disease is the leading cause of death for people of you know, most racial ethnic groups in the United States, including African Americans, American Indians, it really doesn't matter. In fact, they used to say that certain uh, ethnicities would, if you were Asian or perhaps, you would be protected from heart disease because they would look at Asian people in Asia and say, look, these people don't have the same incidence of heart disease that uh, people in the United States or Canada or Western Europe would have. And so there was this medical myth that went on for quite a while that if you were Asian, you were somehow somewhat immune to having some of the lifestyle diseases. Well, they did a study and they, they followed some generations of people who moved from places like China or Japan to the uh, <clears throat> United States and they watched these people over a number of years. And what they discovered and determined from these studies was that the longer these people lived in the Western uh, lifestyle, the more the statistics began, began to be the exact same. It really had nothing to do with their ethnicity. What it had everything to do was their lifestyle, their diet, their exercise, their work, their recreation, and all of those figures. And so it, <clears throat> it really doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. You are not immune or more prone in a hugely significant way to heart disease. <clears throat> The incidence of disease in the USA, um, you know, we're looking at uh, people who have a heart attack per year. We've got uh, 1.2 million people with a heart attack a year. It's uh, over 104,000 per month, um, uh, 24,000 per week, a little over 3,000 a day, 142 per hour or two per minute. And when nearly half of the people are dying from their heart attacks, that basically says somewhere in the United States, every minute someone dies from heart disease. Now, the, the interesting thing is, is that for the majority of, of these people, and somewhat over half, their first warning that they, that they were suffering from cardiovascular disease was sudden death. No opportunity to like, well, I don't feel so good. I'll go to the doctor. He'll check me out. He'll give me a diagnosis. He'll give me some medicine. He'll tell me a few things. I'll go home. I'll change my life or whatever, and we'll, we'll work on this. <clears throat> For somewhere around half of those people, their first indication was they dropped over dead. Somebody has a heart attack about every 34 seconds in the United States. Each minute in the United States, somebody dies from a heart disease-related event. I mean, that's just, that's, it's heartbreaking in a, in a big way. <clears throat> you know, nine out of 10 heart disease patients have at least one risk factor. And I want to run through some of the risk factors for people who have cardiovascular disease. As you can see on our, on our, uh, our chart here, high cholesterol is certainly one of those factors. And that's one of the things that your doctor and pharmacist are gonna work the hardest on because the major uh, portion of our medical uh, community believes that high cholesterol is one of the major issues. And they believe that if we can find a way to give you a medication to lower your cholesterol, that in fact, they have done something positive in terms of increasing your longevity. 
Uh, recently, I have a sister who's a, uh, in the medical field, and she called me and she said, "You know, did you see the did you see the study that got released uh, this week on uh, all of the cholesterol lowering drugs?" And I said, "No." She said, "Well, they do lower the cholesterol, but the, according to this study that was just released, not exactly reducing the death rate a great deal." And uh, I'm like, "Wow, that's that's almost a placebo." Uh, to some extent, although I know that they do, they do save some people, it's just not doing as profound a job as what we had all hoped. <clears throat> High blood pressure, you know, hypertension and, and heart disease seem to go hand in hand. Um, there is a definite uh, correlation there. So many people suffering from hypertension, and this presentation is not about hypertension, but I will kind of just go down a, a side trail for just a, a few moments here on hypertension. Those of you who out there who have a lot of stress in your life, you need to work on de-stressing because it does create uh, part of the environment for hypertension. Those of you who are uh, smoking, <clears throat> whether it's a pipe or your cigar or a cigarette, uh, tobacco definitely has a contribution with hypertension. Your diet has something. I remember as a kid, it was always, oh, they ate too much salt. And if you saw a presentation on hypertension back in the old days, there was always a salt shaker as the graphic. <clears throat> salt is not necessarily the big enemy here. <clears throat> we do need some salt. The problem is, is that a lot of the processed foods contain added sodiums that are not necessary. I remember when I was in the university, We'd all walk in, sit down with our, with our trays, and I would taste my food to see if it was okay and generally ate it. I noticed that many of the other students salted their food before they tasted it. And I asked them, they said, oh, food never has enough salt. This cafeteria food's horrible. It's the only thing we can do to get it down. And uh, I just shook my head and I'm like, well, how can you eat that stuff? I mean, it's, I thought it was already too salty and they were adding more salt to it. <clears throat> but you know, if you are workers, let's say you're a farmer, you're a construction worker, you're outdoors, you're drinking tons of water, and you're perspiring a whole lot, you probably can tolerate that more than somebody who is sitting in a sedentary job in an office. <clears throat> you know, you're a desktop designer or somebody like that. Um, you really need to be eating foods that don't come out of cans, bags, bottles, or boxes. You need to get things that come out of the, out of the, out of the field, out of the garden, off of a tree, from a bush somewhere, and be preparing those things at home. Another corollary factor is diabetes. We find that uh, more and more and more incidents of diabetes and heart disease are walking hand in hand. Many times the same, same people are the same patients with both diagnoses. Uh, many, many times uh, people with cardiovascular disease will be developing diabetes or vice versa. I've seen many diabetics <coughs> If they if they run long enough and they don't control the diabetes, eventually they, their heart disease may kill them before the diabetes even does. <clears throat> we talked about cigarette smoking um, in terms of hypertension. Um, definitely, definitely, uh, I don't see any healthy reason for for tobacco other than I have grown it a time or two as something to kill insects with. Um, I found that if you boil it up in, in, a, in water, you can spray it on your plants. It seems to do a, a fairly decent job of uh, killing all the little aphids and all the little creepy crawlies that eat my garden produce, and it's not terribly toxic to my soil, and so it seemed to work for, well for that. But that's about my only, my only opportunity of use. <clears throat> overweight and obesity, certainly a contribution. How did you get overweight? Well, you ate more than you should. Did you eat more, more uh, celery and more spinach and more... Uh, <clears throat> broccoli than you should to get overweight? Probably not. You probably consumed foods that were low in fiber and uh, high in fat, high in sugar, high in carbohydrates. And those things then were stored <clears throat> in your system as, uh, as fat. Also contained more, more than uh, not if they were animal-based foods, contained a lot of cholesterol and certainly set you up for... Um, a problem with your arteries. The poor diet, 
physical inactivity, wow. I mean, you could actually eat bad food sometimes to some extent. And if you're physically active enough, you can compensate somewhat. And I'm not, say, I'm not telling people, okay, just go out and jog five miles a day and you can eat pizza and, and hamburgers all the time. I'm not trying to make that statement. But what I'm saying is even for people who don't have the ideal diet, physical activity can help to compensate to some extent. And the last one on this chart is stress. And friends, it is amazing how many people have simply destroyed themselves with stress. If you remember a number of years ago, I don't remember exactly how long ago, we had the big Enron energy scandal in the United States. Enron was a company that was into all kinds of energy. and a lot of people lost a lot of money in that thing because it, it, uh, they continued to cook the, cook the accounting books and make it look better. People were investing, and, and it became a, a financial black hole. And um, you know, thousands of people lost their, their life savings in this company. And the founder, uh, by the na- a guy by the name of Ken Lay, uh, was indicted, was sent off, to, uh, he was going to be imprisoned, and he was uh, in the midst of this legal battle, and... They didn't even get a chance to really lock him up because he died from heart failure. Someone actually inter- uh, interviewed his pastor of his church, and he said, no, he said, Ken, actually, his heart just gave out. He could not take the stress and the pressure that was on him when this thing you know, imploded. Uh, not that he even in- ever intended for it to be that way, but, you know, being the CEO, he was the one where the buck stopped, and, uh, you know, the poor guy <clears throat> really was... Uh, he was taking a lot of heat, and it literally and physically destroyed him. You look in the Bible, there was a guy by the name of Nabal. He was a very rich man, lived a very wealthy lifestyle, probably was a way overweight, lived on the fat of the lamb while all of his workers did all the work. And uh, <clears throat> Nabal was a greedy man, and when David was out living on the lamb trying to hide away from Saul, and Saul was trying to kill him, um, Nabal's out here with, he's got all of his shepherds out in the fields and they're, they're, they're out there being marauded by the Amalekites. And uh, so David and his men thought, well, we're here, we're hiding in the wilderness, why don't we just do them a good turn? And so they protected the shepherds and protected the sheep. And it came fall and, you know, things are a little skinny hiding in the caves. And so David and his men suggested that it's, it's harvest time and you guys are having all these big festivals and we're a little getting a little skinny. We can count our ribs. Is there any chance you could share a few things with us? And Nabal, of course, refused and chased them all away and threatened them. And uh, <clears throat> one of the servants reported it to his wife, Abigail, and she then saved his life by taking some things to David. Well, when, da- when Nabal found out how close to death he had been, how close that she had actually intercepted the soldiers as they were coming to take his life. He died. The stress and strain upon his poor heart that just absolutely overwhelmed his physical system. Death statistics for heart attack, 12.5 million of the estimated 32 million worldwide fatal heart attacks <clears throat> or heart attacks are fatal. So if you're going to have a heart attack, just about half of the people who have them are going to die. It's not like I had a heart attack. I got a warning. Okay, I get it. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to be a good boy from now on. I, I, I hear you. <clears throat> well, half of those people, they, they didn't even get a chance to hear it. They're dead. <clears throat> Interesting thing, 40 to 75 percent, depending on whose who's, uh, statistics you look at here, of all these victims die even before they reach the hospital. So if you're planning on the medical safety net saving you from your own stupidity, don't plan on that necessarily happening. They cannot give you a whole brand new heart and just plug it in. You know, it, it's, it's not like you can get there fast enough and they can just pull out your battery and stick in a new one. It's not quite that easy. Heart damage is um, much more permanent and more invasive than that, or pervasive. <clears throat> every, <clears throat> excuse me, every day we lose over 1,400 people in the U.S. from a heart attack. You know, don't just walk your life around in the dark and wonder. Say, well, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. Diagnostics are valuable. You can go to your physician and say, look, I don't know whether I have heart disease or not. 
I think I'm fairly healthy. I think I'm taking care of myself, but I don't really know. You know, the amazing thing is, is you sometimes have you, because people are hearing me say that it goes hand in hand with obesity. There are many people who are very slender who also suffer from heart disease. Some people burn up every calorie you can put into them and some people carry it around with them. But just because you're one who burns it doesn't necessarily mean that you are immune to heart disease. There are many, many slender people who are, who are succumbing to heart disease. Some of the valuable diagnostic tools that you should avail yourself uh, of, number one would be the angiogram. Your physician can actually examine your arteries and see how clogged they are. Um, they can do that through various ultrasound methods, but sometimes if they really need to know, rather than you guessing or your physician guessing, they actually can do the, the test where they put the catheter into your arteries and they can actually see inside and tell you what condition they are in. And sometimes for some patients, that's a very valuable thing. Electrocardiogram or EKG, you get some of the neurological conductivity studies. The, they, can, they can actually determine uh, some things about the function of the, the heart. The stress test to uh, be a combination you see is the, the man who's on the treadmill there. He's running, his physician's monitoring him. Just see how well your body does when you put it under load. You know, we do this with equipment. You'll take your truck in to see how, how well your engine is running. They'll put it on a dynamometer and they can print it out and say, look, you know, uh, you need to set your timing here. You need to, to increase your fuel on your injectors and whatever. We do the same with people. Put them on the dynamometer, put them on the treadmill. We find out how the heart is actually functioning when it's under, under stress. <clears throat> Echocardiogram, you can see the actual structure in the heart, see how things are doing. Ultrasound, similar. You can actually get a chance to see inside uh, the heart somewhat and see, see what the structural things are doing. Blood pressure, Anybody who has any doubts or questions or uh, anything on their cardiovascular system, taking your blood pressure on a, at least a weekly basis is a really good idea. If there is serious questions, I think a daily basis. Some people do it more than one time a day. Um, another test is a pro-time test. They actually will take a little bit of your blood. They'll see how, how well your blood clots up. You know, we have, your blood needs to clot. Because if you cut yourself, uh, it's nice to have the little platelets in there. They'll go in there and they'll, they'll clog the hole up and you'll stop leaking your vital precious body fluids and uh, it saves your life. God in invented and created us to do that. The problem comes is when our, our blood begins to get sticky. And so our cells all begin to clump together. And, and a couple of things that can happen. One is the more fat you consume in your diet, the more your red blood cells will stick together and the less oxygen that they can carry throughout your body through the hemoglobin and your brain begins to be a little bit on the starved side for oxygen. You don't think as well. When you can't carry as much oxygen, your, uh, your body just doesn't do as well in, with, in terms of immunity when it comes to uh, aerobic uh, organisms. It, it can't protect you as well because there's not enough concentrations of oxygen there. Anyway, the pro time can give you an idea of how what your clotting time is. And you know, your physician may say, hey, your, your blood's way, way too sticky. It's way too thick, too heavy. And... Uh, you know, he'll, he'll maybe want to put you on a blood thinner or something. Or if you're somebody who's more into natural things, you might go into your cupboard and st say, you know what, I'm going to change my diet so that I don't need those medications um, to band-aid me together while I'm, while I'm, I'm hoping to uh, survive this. Another valuable test that's fairly new, it's probably, I don't know exactly how new, but you begin to hear more and more about it in the last, say, 10 years, is called the C-reactive protein study. And that actually is a marker um, of inflammation in the, in the uh, uh, cardiovascular system. And without inflammation, it's very difficult for the, uh, the plaque to form on your artery walls. And uh, if you can get that test done, your physician can tell you whether or not you are at a major risk for a, a negative cardiovascular event. Somewhat de depending, it's, it's just one of those things to, to try and help you know whether, whether or not uh, the, if that, there's a lot of inflammation going there, you know the chances are that your body will be more likely to have 
a, a stroke or a heart attack or a, or a blood clot of some sort, if it's lower, then you know that your blood is, is uh, flowing easier more than likely. It's not bulletproof, but it's a good, good little window of, uh, of information to look into the body. Another one is called the lipoprotein A test. Uh, you know, these are things that if you're a cardiologist, you already know, but if you're a layperson, you may or may not have heard about these things. Maybe something you might want to ask your physician about <clears throat> and uh, take advantage of that. Also, another test, we check for homocysteine levels in the bloodstream and can tell uh, some of the risk factors. Well, let's look at not so much of the negative side here. Let's look a little bit at what we can do to improve water consumption. You know, if your blood is really, really thick and really, really sticky, the more water you consume, the more opportunity you have to flush some of these things out and to thin the blood down a little bit and get your blood to be able to flow easier. And it makes it easier on your heart. Can you imagine if your blood is, having, is very thick and the, the heart is having to push this peanut butter like stuff through, and I know that's way over exaggerated, but moving a very heavy viscous fluid, it has to work so much harder and, ex and expel the, to expel the blood through the valves. Uh, way harder, whereas if it were thinned down with adequate water consumption, uh, those you know eight to ten glasses a day, you'll find that the heart just can rest more. And uh, you know our heart only has so many beats on it when it got put into our body. Why wear it out? Um, we only get one. Aerobic exercise. I sometimes have to think of myself a bit as a hypocrite because I, I travel a lot, I'm in, in and out of airports a lot, and I'm busy, and sometimes I'm in an office a lot. I have to really work on that one for myself. It's hard to get enough exercise, and I see people out running while I'm you know, in a shuttle or something, I think, here I am just rolling along, and they're out there working hard at what they're doing, and they're getting the benefits, and I'm getting none whatsoever, and I'm a little jealous. <clears throat> and then when I am home, I get so busy with my routine. It's one phone call after the other, and I'm on the computer, and I'm typing really, really, really fast, trying to get projects done, and, and all of a sudden, it's time to go to bed, and I was like, I didn't get any exercise. You know, you actually have to schedule life you have to make physical provision, just like water consumption. I found that I was drinking very little water and very, just barely getting by, but I found that if I would put a big quart jar of water on my desk, it would be gone two or three times a day simply because I'm so busy, it's, it's just something to do as a break from what I'm doing, and I would constantly be reaching for my water and drinking my water, and it was good for me. If it wasn't there, I wouldn't get up and do it. The Bible says, make no provision for the flesh to do evil, but I'll do the reciprocal. I will make provision for the flesh to do what's good for me, and so I will get my water, and I'll put it out there, and when I do that, I consume it. The same with your exercise. <clears throat> Sleep and rest. You know, they do, they've just recently released a study that I was reading not long ago. We don't get enough sleep. It seems to me that somebody turned the merry-go-around up a notch, and it's going faster. And by merry-go-round, I mean the world. It seems like we don't get 24 hours a day anymore. I think we're getting about 21. Um, I know that's not real because the clocks would all be off, and we'd be having sunrise at 4 o'clock in the afternoon if that happened very quickly. But I, figuratively to me, there's just not enough hours in the day to get the stuff done that I need to do. I'm trying to do too much, trying to accomplish too much, and I don't get the sleep that I need. And we need to change that. We need to be in bed by 9 o'clock every night. And I know that sounds crazy to a lot of people, but if you're in bed by 9 o'clock every night, <clears throat> availing yourself of that sleep. You're going, to, you're going to live longer, according to the studies that they just released. Stress management, <clears throat> wow, it is big. And so what is stress? Stress, uh, stress is good. You know, if you back up against a wood stove and it's hot and it burns you, <clears throat> if you stay there, what's it going to do? It's going to destroy you. You're going to go up in smoke. If you feel the stress of the stressor telling you that your backside is hot, you what? You move away from that stove. And that's a good positive response. The problem is that sometimes your job, your marriage, whatever's going on in your life, some of these things, it's really hard to just jump off, jump away from it like you would from moving away from a hot stove. <clears throat> how, what stress is really defined as, it is how you and I respond to the stressors in our lives. Do we respond to those in a positive way? Do we respond to those in a negative way? Do we just sit there and, and, and 
<clears throat> enjoy the misery? Or do we find a positive way to handle and manage these things so that they don't destroy us? Proper diet, we're going to talk about that in depth in a moment. And avoiding harmful substances. Um, if you're going to be controlling heart disease, lifestyle is a huge thing. Dietary changes, exercise, stress management, medications, and for those of us who are a little bit more bio-friendly, nutritional supplementation, I think all of those things can be a factor in helping you have a better program. You know, the lady on our, on our screen right now, uh, she's not got a very good program. She's sitting there watching the TV with a, with a caffeinated beverage in one hand, an ice cream cone in the other, and she's got chips and popcorn sitting there to follow up with when she's done with what's in her hands. You know, she's sitting there watching this stressful drama. So her adrenaline's just going. She's all into the thing. I mean, you can just think of the, the effects in the cardiovascular system. <clears throat> Definitely not a poster child. Alcohol and tobacco. Those are things that have got to leave if you want to enjoy a good cardiovascular system. Yes, I know that there are studies that show up on the internet or saying that wine is good for you. A little alcohol is good for you. You'll even find uh, now websites that where doctors are coming out and saying moderate alcohol consumption is good for you. And, but if you go over the, over the extreme and you drink too much, then you destroy yourselves. Personally, I think that any alcohol consumption is probably not good for me, and some reasons for that are, you know, we're here in Canada right now, it gets cold in the winter, and you get uh, moisture in your gas tank, it turns to ice. What do you put in there to absorb that? <clears throat> alcohol. Alcohol will absorb the, the water and take it and dry it out and put it back into suspension so you can burn it up and get rid of it. It actually will, alcohol in your system actually is going to work the same way to absorb the water out of your blood. It's going to make your, your cells more brittle and less likely to function well. What we have found in what they call the French paradox on wine consumption in, in uh, Western Europe, I really think comes, and I think uh, science will show this, that it, the protection for the heart comes from the grapes, not from the wine. It comes from a chemical compound called polyphenols, which have a cardiovascular protective mechanism. And you don't have to have the alcohol to have that. You can get it from the grapes or the grape juice. In fact, recently I noticed that the, the uh, researcher that had promoted this French paradox, um, some of his data was now being called into question recently. And uh, it, it appears that perhaps some of his study actually was fraudulent. So um, I think the, it, the, the way that God designed us to live in the Garden of Eden and, and the way that he continues to want us to uh, live our lives, I think is definitely ahead of the time. <clears throat> Tobacco, as we talked about before, has no positive impact. <clears throat> Diet, it's huge, fr friends. It's a big, big part of this. You know, what's the, you know, what's the American diet like right now? Well, it's a, it's a cheeseburger and fries and a, and a strawberry milkshake or a chocolate milkshake for lunch. That's what a lot of people are living on. These ideas <clears throat> that nutritionists are trying to promote to people of eating your, you know, your five servings of fruit and vegetables a day, people are resistant against that. There are, our appetites are perverted. We love the high fat, greasy, high cholesterol based foods. And those are the ones that create the environment for our arteries to clog <clears throat> up in a major way. If you see in the, in the, in the uh, picture that we have right now of the arteries. We've got a healthy artery up on top, blood's flowing through just fine. <clears throat> we began to see where there's some inflammation has developed on the artery wall and some uh, <clears throat> cholesterol has begun to uh, deposit there. It's narrowing off the, the, the way. Eventually, if our blood continues on to have the same level of health that it does, the artery, our cardiovascular system has this continual burden of uh, inflammation and um, high fat, high cholesterol flowing through it all the time, it, you know, it just clogs up and eventually you'll end up with a clot that can't get through and then you've got a stroke or, or, uh, or a heart attack and it's just, uh, it's just the devastating way. The foods that we should be consuming, as we're seeing on our, on our screen right now, are the things that uh, God put in the Garden of Eden. It's the, it's the fruits, it's the vegetables, it's the nuts, it's the grains. Those are God's uh, original plan for us. And scientists today are telling us, hey, you know, there was some, there was some good science behind that because, you know, you look at the, the, uh, some substances called uh, 
carotenoids that we find in uh, like carrots and beets, those things actually are a coating that goes on the artery walls and, and prevents anything from sticking there. And uh, you know, you can get that from juicing them or from eating them. It really doesn't matter how you get it in there. Um, we find that um, there are many phytonutrients in these plant-based foods that will protect us in the seeds and the beans and, and things we find what we, uh, 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 chemicals we call sterols or sterilins. These will help to suppress the inflammation and the, and the creation of these uh, plaque deposits. <clears throat> Another thing that's awesome in all of these live foods, friends, is the, uh, the, uh, the existence of the live enzymes. Especially the more raw foods you eat, the more enzymes you will consume. Enzymes are the spark of life. Many health educators will tell you enzymes are the spark of life. <clears throat> and the more of these things you consume in their raw and natural state, the more enzymes you consume. Enzymes not only cause uh, or create uh, an, the uh, emphasis and the increase of the biochemical reactions that are supposed to happen in your system, they also suppress inflammation. And the more enzymes you will consume, the less inflammation you'll have, the less opportunity you have for cardiovascular disease, for plaque to build up and to have these negative cardiovascular events. You certainly can stay much healthier if you live on that, that dietary program that God gave us in Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> Aerobic exercise, experts are recommending for a healthy cardiovascular system, it needs to be done at least four times a week uh, and for at least 30 minutes a day. And you know, not only does it help your cardiovascular system, it increases your immune response and we're finding also that it keeps the mind more active and people who are doing this actually can retain their intellect longer in life than they would if they were to just be sedentary all of their lives. <clears throat> you know, you don't have to be a jogger. You know, it's something I'm not really good at. I don't have really, really good knees. Uh, damaged my knees when I was a teenager, and uh, I've kind of struggled along. But there's a lot of other good things. You know, you can use the elliptical trainers. They're low impact. Uh, swimming is a great way to do it. Bicycling. There's just a lot of good ways you can get cardiovascular exercise without having a lot of high impact exercise uh, that will damage your joints. For those of you who are interested in nutritional supplementation, it is to be part of this. I urge you, don't think you can continue on to eat this horrible diet that probably caused the situation you're in and go to, down to the health food store and get some magic supplements that will cover it all up. <clears throat> it's not going to work. Your, your foundation needs to be your, your lifestyle. But we find that essential fatty acids from things like... Uh, Flax seeds and, and chia seeds and, and things of that nature definitely can be protecting. We've heard for a long time that people who eat a lot of fish with all the fish oils are going to be healthier. Studies now are beginning to take a second look and saying, well, we maybe came to the wrong conclusion on some of this. Um, may or may not be what we thought it was, but we're not going to find that if you're going to be getting the essential fatty acids from things like you know, your, your, uh, your, your seeds or some of your nuts. There are some supplements that, are, that come from various countries called Google lipids. They're, they're resins that grow on little shrubs. <clears throat> they definitely are shown to reduce uh, cardio, or the uh, cholesterol. Fiber, friends, the, one of the great things in the, in the raw or natural diet is the existence of fiber. Fiber is awesome. It helps to absorb all of the excess things in your intestinal tract that like bile and whatever that aren't used that would be turned into cholesterol. We, we consume cholesterol if we're eating a non-plant-based diet or even vegan vegetarians have high cholesterol because they're manufacturing it. But the more fiber you eat, the less your cholesterol level is going to be because you absorb those things before they can be transferred <clears throat> and they're taken out of the body. One of the good uh, things that a lot of people are recommending, a lot of doctors, a lot of nutritionists recommending coenzyme Q10, soy products, they have the sterilins in them. I would recommend that they are not GMO. I would, I would definitely recommend that your soy products would come from organic sources rather than a, a non-organic because you could have the genetically modified and I don't know what you really have when you buy that. <clears throat> Vitamin C, <clears throat> Linus Pauling was uh, 
a pioneer in this. He used to tell, uh, recommend vitamin C and L-proline and L-lysine, a couple of amino acids. They, those he maintained would help to uh, lower the lipoprotein A levels and, and keep the body healthier. Garlic, we know that garlic, when taken high enough, there was a study done at Loma Linda University by a Dr. Benjamin Lau that uh, was released that showed where increasing uh, garlic intake would have a corollary uh, decrease in, in serum cholesterol in many, many of the patients. And actually, if eaten long enough and, and high enough, actually they felt would, as long as it was part of a, a good diet, could actually be part of actually scavenging some of the plaque off the artery walls. <clears throat> I know that it has a unpleasant smell. Some people don't like it a whole lot. Other people love it. I remember a man in Australia who was making sandwiches out of garlic and an old lady was unhappy with him and she said, Alan, that stuff stinks. And he said, I don't think it stinks. I think it's a fragrance. <clears throat> he loved it. I'm, I'm not quite with him on that. I'm somewhere in the middle. Plant sterols, <clears throat> those, those compounds that help uh, block inflammation. Niacin or vitamin B3. Folic acid. Some people have absorbed folic acid readily, others not so well. They may need a type called methylfolate. <clears throat> um, vitamin B12, vitamin B6, enzymes, all those things are things that you're, you're finding <clears throat> uh, nutritionists and uh, doctors and, and nurse practitioners who are into a more uh, <clears throat> integrated approach. These are some of the things that you'll be seeing from them. Uh, more controversial is the red yeast rice. Um, government's not real happy with that one right now. It actually contains a statin type drug naturally in it. Uh, if you're going to consume that thing, uh, many people are now saying don't do it without coenzyme Q10 because the coenzyme Q10 can protect you from the statin-like effect from it. Um, <clears throat> ask, ask your physician or whoever your medical practitioner is to give you a little bit of guidance on this so that you don't make a mistake while you're at it. But, you know, in everything, I'm, I'm, we're talking about the heart. I want to talk about the heart that we know from the Bible. <clears throat> I want to talk about the, the, the soul, temple, the heart, the mind. <clears throat> because I think it has a lot to do. Proverbs 17.22, because attitude and action have a lot together. Do they go together as well? Uh, Proverbs 17.22 says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. What goes on in your mind, what the old ancient philosophers called the heart, has a lot to do with the life. Proverbs 23, verse 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. People who are pessimistic versus people who are optimistic, their life, their health, everything is so tuned into what is going on in their mind. And so the Bible is telling us here, we need to be guardians of our thoughts. We need to be connecting our thoughts with God so that we are getting directions from Him so that we can, have, if we place our confidence in God, I tell you, it really helps with the stress factors a great deal. Far less issues with stress when you can put all your burdens on Christ <clears throat> and know that God will take care of you. Now, some people say, well, some of this stuff you're describing, man, it sounds kind of like it's works-oriented. This is a very legalistic way to live your life, you know? I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and do this, and do that. You know, I just want to have fun. I don't want to have to be burdened down with eating all those vegetables and fruits and seeds and things. <clears throat> And some people have pointed me to Romans chapter 1, verse 17. It says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. It is written, The just shall live by faith. I just have faith in Jesus, and when my time is up, it's up. And I'm not going to mess around. You know, I'd, I'd rather die than give up my, my pizza and my hamburgers and my pot roast. <clears throat> I've heard people say that. More often than not, people will say that when they're very addicted to, <clears throat> excuse me, when they're addicted to a perverse type of a, of a dietary lifestyle. But my question is, who created the human body? God did. Who knows what's best for this human body? God does. He's the, he's the inventor of this mechanism. And when he comes out in, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 29 in there, and he tells us what we should be eating, and later on in chapter 3, after sin, he adds the vegetables to the fruits and the grains and the nuts. 
<clears throat> there was a reason for all of that. It's, it's based on some very intense science, and God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. And I believe that if you're going to live your life by faith, <clears throat> that you should have faith and confidence in the one who created the mechanism that you live in. And if he has given us ample evidence that we can be healthier living this way, <clears throat> I think faith means that we will follow on through that. We talk about our hearts, we give our hearts to Jesus. Um, <clears throat> we, we talk about our heart as being you know, our soul temple, it's where we think, it's what we do. <clears throat> we know that's figuratively uh, spoken. Luke 21, verse 26, men's hearts are failing them for fear in the last days. <clears throat> They're looking at those things that are, that are about to come upon the world, and you know, we look at the news today, and we're, you know, we're shaking in our boots sometimes because we see how awful this world is beginning to be. <clears throat> Revelation 21, verse 8 says, the fearful, I'm talking about people who don't go into heaven when Jesus comes. <clears throat> First one up, the fearful. Now, friends, I didn't come here to scare you at all. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has made a provision for us not to be in fear. He gave us a provision to use a sound mind. <clears throat> Psalms 51, chapter 10, David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. If we want to have... <clears throat> that relationship with God that connects us with him and to have our past moved out and our nature changed, God is willing to create that in us. Psalms 33, 6 is by the word of the Lord where the heavens made, you know, you just need to spend more time with God's word. In God's word is his creative power. The same word that spoke the world into existence is in God written form in your Bible, and the more time you spend, the more, more your, your, your human nature will be created into a divine nature. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, God's talking here to John. He's telling him who is going to come into the gates of, uh, of heaven. He says, him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write on him the name of my God, He's going to be one of the family. We need to be transformed. We need to overcome the world. We need to overcome the sin in our life. Our sinful human nature needs to go away, and God is willing for that to happen for every one of us. You may say, well, I can't overcome. I am too weak. I have just, just had too many downfalls in my life. <clears throat> well, I want to send you to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, where it tells us, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and to find grace to help in the time of need. You know, your weakness is God's opportunity to give you power. Many people think that grace is the equivalent of mercy. Friends, it is not. That is a, that is a disaster that's come into the theological world. Grace is not mercy, friends. Grace is God's power in your life to help you to become a new person. It's God willing to give you his power to change you from what you were to what he has in mind for you to be. <clears throat> Salvation is what God wants for each one of us. You and I have the opportunity <clears throat> to have our lifestyle changed and to become healthy physically, we also have that opportunity to have our hearts, our spiritual heart changed and to become healthy in a spiritual sense and our nature to become changed from human to divine so that when Jesus comes, he'll look down, he'll see that family resemblance in us, the name and the character and forehead, and he's giving that, that invitation to each one of us to accept that and to grow in grace and become more like Jesus every day so that we can indeed become permanent members in the family of God.